and I am really glad to be here. I'm taking this call from my studio and I bet we have people connecting from the kitchen, the bedroom or the living room and who knows, maybe the office as well. I'm gonna introduce Evan. We're all here, Boston Reconnect to uh, talk about a very exciting topic ahead of us. Um, just a couple of words about me. My name is Lucy. I am a tech reporter for the Boston Business Journal. I cover tech, venture capital, occasionally a nice startup that catch, catches my eye. And uh, been in my position for a couple of years uh, and uh, reporting. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, session ahead of us. So we're going to talk about the future of the Boston tech ecosystem. And uh, I am, um, I hope we're going to chat about and uh, going to be in the driver's seat uh, and take this conversation on, uh, on a couple of things that are really important. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what is exciting in the ecosystem right now, what is holding us back a little bit. But really, this conversation is going to be about the future. We've all had a really hard, challenging year, and we're not going to talk about that. We're all going to talk about the future, and uh, I hope it's going to be a very forward-looking uh, conversation. Um, let me introduce you to our um, panelists that I see on my screen here. Um, let's see what we got. Uh, first of all, we have, well, if, if uh, my panelists are many juniors, if there's one thing they have in common that is the all connectors in a very Malcolm Gladwell sense. They are people who know people. Um, let's start with, uh, oh, I see Clement Casalo. It's right here on my screen. Clem, I know him as Clem. Would you mind waving to our audience just so they can locate you easy on their screen? Hey, everyone. Clem is the managing director of Techstars Boston, one of the largest accelerate, startup accelerator that we have in town. And he also is uh, um, an angel investor in over 50 uh, startups. Welcome, Clem. Um, moving right along, I see we have uh, uh, Yasmin Cruz Ferrin. She is uh, um, uh, co-founder and partner at Visible Hand the VC that we have it in town. Um, yes, yeah, so let's see your wave to the audience. Ah, oh, there you are. Uh, we're doing a roll call a little bit to keep things moving a little bit easier. Um, um, Visible Hand VC is a, a fund and a fellowship program that really looks to support uh, underrepresented talent that we have uh, in the ecosystem. And then last but not least, we have Matt Wozni. Matt, uh, roll call, Let, let's see a double wave with two hands to our audience here. Here you are. Well, Matt is uh, uh, the vice president uh, of Product uh, Legacy, a male fertility startup we have uh, in uh, Boston. And uh, well, we're a Boston Reconnect, so connection is important. He's also uh, the co-founder of the Harvard Founders Network. Welcome, everybody. Um, I hope uh, we're going to have an amazing conversation. And my style as a moderator is uh, we're going to jump into it. So first of all, uh, um, I'd like uh, we've all been uh, mostly at home in the past uh, in the past months. So one thing that I'm going to ask you first uh, is uh, while staying at home uh, and maybe not having a chance to go out so much that much as we used to do, what is the one thing that you saw is new happening in the ecosystem? Um, it could be a person, it could be a practice, a trend. What have you saw? Basically, what is uh, right now that caught your attention? And Clem, I'm going to start with you and then uh, I'm going to put the other people on the spot. Well, uh, without sharing some hot goss, uh, I'm seeing actually a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot that over the past three weeks, at least three institutional investors leaving to start companies. So that's a trend like moving out of investment and going and starting companies. So I'm excited for 2021 on, on that front. Fantastic. And we definitely saw uh, pandemic notwithstanding. We've, we've had a lot of new unicorns, a lot of new people starting companies. So, so Definitely, the pandemic hasn't stopped uh, the Boston ecosystem. Yeah, so what have you seen? Um, I 
I think I've definitely seen um, more more opportunities to to connect late at night and to stay on Clubhouse way too long. That's probably something <laughs> into the evening. Um, I would say that's a, a habit that I've picked up in uh, in the past year. Definitely, that's a habit that I picked as well. I started probably um, in January. I started, you know, hearing people talking about Clubhouse. That, uh, we met on Clubhouse. We're moderating a session on Clubhouse, and then it definitely picked up. So, well, we needed a virtual space to connect. Matt, what about you? What did you see? I'll focus on the slightly more obvious one. Um, I think a couple of years back, there was a famous piece in the Boston Globe, uh, Scott Kirstner wrote, where are the Massachusetts IPOs? It was the year of the IPO, and everywhere you looked except in Massachusetts, you saw IPOs. For a long time, folks in Boston would say, you can't build a unicorn, or folks outside of Boston would say, you can't build a unicorn here. Then they would say, you can't build a decacorn here. And then a couple of months back, somebody said, you can't build a $100 billion company here. Um, but then look, we just raised a $10 billion round with Clabio uh, recently. Um, in, in the city of Austin. Uh, Ginkgo is about to SPAC for almost $20 billion, a synthetic bio, like the leading synthetic biology company in, in, in the world. Uh, Toast, Flywire are going to be mega, probably decacorn businesses that are going to IPO later this year. So, so um, we are building businesses that have never been this big in the city of Austin. And this is, this is new. Uh, I mean, HubSpot has become a $20 billion business, but it wasn't a decacorn when it IPO. We are, we are launching Decacorn, gigantic businesses, some businesses that may become $100 billion businesses in Boston. That was extremely exciting. It is uh, definitely uh, the rise of the SPACs deal uh, um, has been another new trend uh, that I've been uh, uh, covering in my reporting. Uh, um, Evolve technology, a couple of 3D printing uh, uh, companies, uh, Mark Ford, uh, and well, that's the metal uh, where uh, 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 some of the companies, the tech companies that I cover, that went to uh, that route. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, um, like, we're going to talk about a couple of more companies later in another question. Uh, uh, but uh, first of all, uh, let's clean a, bit, a little bit the slate and see um, what is right now that makes uh, the Boston tech ecosystem, ecosystem uh, great. We're going to talk about the downside later because I think it's important. But first of all, what is right now that is working, that is really uh, helping us going forward? Any thoughts on that? Uh, Matt, this time, let's start with you. Sure. So there, there's a couple of things that are required to make any boss, to make any ecosystem click. Um, and, and it's a known formula set, and you see it in, you know, in Boston, New York, and other places as well. And in some of these um, areas, we do phenomenally well. So, so one of those is risk capital infrastructure. Um, relative to most ecosystems, Boston is phenomenal here. We, we invented the idea of venture capital in the city. Um, and in terms of venture financing, um, including life sciences investing, we're top two in, in, in the world. Um, uh, then you talk about kind of the funnel of talent that comes in. We have almost 300,000 university students who are funneling into as joiners or founders of businesses. Um, those universities count as R&D centers. You can't have a phenomenal innovative ecosystem without an R&D center. Uh, we have five of the top 50 universities in the country in, in, you know, in Greater Boston um, and two of the top five. Um, uh, those universities, Harvard and MIT, are responsible for you know, some of the largest amounts of venture capital financing um, in the country, for some of the largest um, market capitalization creation um, in, in, in the country. Um, uh, and so, so we do these things exceptionally well as an ecosystem. Yeah, so what about uh, the venture capital ecosystem? What is working uh, and uh, any thoughts uh, on what is not? <laughs> yeah, so I will, I'll tackle it from both sides. I will say that collaboration uh, with Visible Hands, we launched during COVID. Uh, we've been raising money and we set our application timeline for it actually just closed uh, last week and we had 910 applicants from across the country. And I will say that Clem has spent time with my partner, Devin is helping us out at Underscore uh, on our selection process and everywhere we've turned in standing up visible hands in our fun one, everyone has been open to helping to really start at the top of the funnel with talent 
and, and really bring them upstream and create the conditions for underrepresented talent to be successful. And, you know, it, it could have been different. It could have been, uh, you know, good luck. Let's see, um, you know, how you do and, you know, come at it from an implementation risk perspective, but everyone wants to see a, a talent pipeline for their own deal flow sake. And, and it's been great. Um, and then I would say on the flip side, you know, you know also quoting Scott, um, you know, article um, that came out about, you know, in, in the Boston ecosystem, only 8% of VC lasts, you know, over, I think it was over a longer wing, window of time um, receiving, you know, venture capital funding. And that doesn't include the compounding bias of race on top of gender. So I would say we we have a lot of work to do because we know the future does need to be uh, for innovation. You know, inclusion improves. Um, sorry, <laughs> innovation improves with inclusion. Uh, so that's something that we want to make sure that from a product and user centric perspective, that all of our perspectives are are being taken into account and and foundationally not as an add on uh, retrofit. So I would say that I'm really excited um, to see how collaborative uh, the ecosystem has been. Mm -hmm. Okay. Clem, I know you are fundamentally an optimist, an optimist. Uh, so I, I couldn't. I need to ask you, what is? Do you think? What do you think is the number one positive thing that we have in Boston? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm like every time we speak about Boston, we tend to like speak about hey, why are we different or what we like. But I think we have so many great, amazing things here. Uh, what I've been seeing is the aura of boston although we say that we're not that good at marketing I like all the facts prove something different we are extremely good at being the shining uh ecosystem in the tech world uh like they are i've never seen over the past 12 months so many people from outside of boston trying to fund Boston-based company, Boston-based founders. Uh, just like a Techstars portfolio, in the past 12 months, we've raised, like uh, at this point, 560 million was injected in just the Techstars portfolio, out of which two thirds came from outside of the city. However, they were most of the time, this outside of, of the city capital was led or introduced by people inside Boston. So we're actually extremely good at being recognized to what Matt shared earlier uh, on like being recognized for our expertise. Uh, we might be myopic and not seeing that, but the world is seeing it. So that's what we're extremely good, being recognized outside and Boston is a brand that is stronger and stronger in a world where geography doesn't really matter. The expertise from Boston does is one of the biggest level of, uh, of uh, approval out there. So I'm extremely excited about that. The brand of Boston is uh, is growing with actors like Greentown Labs that have been organizing like thousand people plus conferences uh, specialized on clean tech. Like we get like this aura that is that is growing. Mass Change has been doing a lot also to to broadcast how amazing we are at the city. So yeah. So that's what we're doing really, really good. Over the past 12 months, we're better and better at marketing our city, all of us as connectors, ambassadors of what we do great here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, um, if there's something that I'm hearing uh, in um, sort of in all of your answers is uh, there is something that uh, the Boston brand is recognizable. Uh, and I've also he heard in what Matt was saying, the words number two. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the cat is out of the bag, it's obvious. Uh, uh, Boston is second to Silicon Valley. And uh, if, um, uh, if we look at uh, uh, recent news that have to do with acquisitions, we can see that uh, major big companies, tech companies, the big players are sort of coming to Boston to shop around to buy companies. I'm thinking about uh, uh, Nuance uh, uh, Communications, which was uh, is in the process of being acquired by Microsoft for around 20 billion. I'm thinking about a um, couple of more what, uh, Uber that came in at the beginning of the year and acquired Drizzly for over $1 billion. Thinking about, well, there was also TaxJar acquired by Stripe. So 
In a way, we can see, of course, the Boston brand is strong and we have uh, all those companies coming here and buying uh, all those success stories that are wrote in Massachusetts. But at the same time, I'm going to say this. Um, are we happy about it? Shouldn't Boston companies uh, uh, be the companies that make those big acquisitions? Well, well, we are like, I mean, there is like you have like the toast of the world that are becoming leaders. Uh, you, like you have like, so, so it's, it's a balance, like you need liquidity in an ecosystem. So the biggest marker of success w w when we look at leading indicator of like future growth of an ecosystem is how much are the individuals in this ecosystem reinvesting uh, into it. And so what we're seeing right now is the emergence of a new wealth of like people that were the early employees of Wayfair. Like in the past, we had like the Lotus Mafia that like, and the Deck Mafia that funded the first very first generations. And there was a second generation in the 2000s, all the load me ecosystem, all, like you get like all this like generation, this generational wealth to some extent that is created. And now with the liquidity, it's not a bad thing that we create, that we, that we create companies that are highly marketable outside of, of our ecosystem, uh, it's a balance. We have both, and the fact that, like Dharmesh was speaking about earlier, about all the ecosystem out of HubSpot starting new companies, that is healthy. And so the fact that companies are being acquired, well, that's part, that's part of the game. Some of them are going to be standalone for a long time, and others are are, are going to actually thrive as part of a bigger ecosystem. In uh, like just using uh, examples, like like all Spotify. The core research and development of Spotify is powered by a company called Econest that was in Boston that got acquired that like has all this like deep AI here that then span out like uh, like half a dozen companies from the early employees uh, here in the ecosystem. So these are this is healthy to have a mix of both, and we are creating a mix of both. Matt, yes, anything that you may want to add to this? I think we'll get to the point of, of how we can improve um, to become number one later in the discussion. I agree broadly with Clem. Um, the ecosystem of angels giving back, of, of, of former founders, former joiners creating that virtuous cycle of giving back is essential to our ecosystem. And it's actually partly new. We've had it in the past um, with previous mega companies. But if you look back to some of those gigantic outcomes that Boston had, for example, in the 1950s with Raytheon um, and, and, and through really until like 2000, you didn't have as many angels as you do now. Um, an ecosystem of angels that perpetuated by necessity in Stanford uh, and in the Bay Area because there was no risk capital financing, they had to be the risk capital financing, didn't exist as an institution in Boston. And you're seeing that change right now. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add is that um, it's it's great to have a healthy crop of angels, but I would definitely shout out the Wayfair Mafia for 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 being substantial and their ability to, to really provide substantial risk capital. I think that's also an aspect of how of it being new that it's it's not you know it's sizable enough to build new. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm going to be a little bit skeptical here in the bunch. Uh, we're happy of how things are, but um, what is then that we can do better? What is that we can uh, sort of uh, take maybe from other ecosystem? Because after all, yes, see in the chat, Boston, uh, uh, we're in second place and that's a great place to be, but we have uh, down uh, in the ranking uh, a few other ecosystems uh, that are uh, uh, doing really great things. Um, thinking Tampa, thinking Miami, um, thinking Atlanta in many senses. Uh, um, what is uh, that we sort of, we can uh, copy or steal, if you prefer, from, from those ecosystem, uh, ecosystems uh, that maybe we're not doing enough here in Boston? Yeah, so do you want to start? Yeah, I, I think it's really important, for example, um, as a, um, a proxy for for activity and national talent playing out. So at Visible Hands, our, we, for our application process, we just received 910 applicants across the country. And the largest um, contingency came from New York, and then second Boston, then LA, and then San Francisco. So I, I think it shows that 
and this is all women and people of color who have um, either go to market or technical skills and want to build companies that are venture backable. Uh, this isn't a main street play. So if that that says something that you know New York certainly from a fintech perspective and Boston have a really strong financial sector financial services sector it's interesting to see you know how New York has taken that brand and really run with it and have we've seen some um, some migration from companies and founders in that direction this year and then similarly um, it's not just the heat I think Miami and Atlanta both have a very you know inclusive brand in terms of fostering an ecosystem for talent so I think Boston really needs to look forward and make sure that we are we are creating our own narrative and we're on you know we're playing offense and, and like Clem says, that we're not so busy playing defense the whole time because it's definitely uh, becoming a more competitive scene. And I think our spot at number two is is potentially at risk if we if we don't, you know, make some improvements um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Matt, Clem, uh, what, uh, what are some of those improvements uh, that Yaz was mentioning? What is that we need to sort of import here in Boston moving forward from other ecosystems. Matt, let's start. Please. I'm happy to go first. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, this, this, this is a good conversation. Um, I, I think there are two things that we need to be focusing on. Um, the first is marketing the city and then focusing is the second. Um, uh, with limited resources as a, as a as an ecosystem, it's just like a startup. You can only focus on so many things and be great. And so focusing here means focusing on sectors that we know we can win on. Um, we can talk about that kind of in, uh, in, in a little bit of time. Marketing is something that comes up all the time. As a city, we don't do a good enough job marketing the city, marketing the, the advantages of it. And so this really breaks down into two buckets for me. It's marketing to retain talent and marketing to attract talent. When you're talking about attracting talent, you're talking about bringing in immigrants into the city, you're talking about getting folks from the United States, from other cities willing to move into the city. Um, the package that's required for that is a little bit different. Um, when you're talking about retaining talent, you're talking about retaining the folks who live inside the city, but you're also talking about retaining students. And the stuff that's needed to address that is also different. So let's kind of go through that very sequentially and very quickly. Um, in terms of um, attracting talent, um, uh, you know, we, we talk about Boston. Boston has a reputation of being a white city, as being a racist city. Today, we're the sixth most diverse city in the country. Um, in terms of, uh, we talk about Boston not being equitable. It's true. There's a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot that needs to be done. Um, nevertheless, in terms of venture financing, it's the second best place for women to raise money. If you're going to Harvard Business School as a woman, you're three times more likely to raise money than if you went to Stanford Business School. Um, and so generally speaking, um, for, for, for Boston punches better above its weight than it has a reputation for being. We don't speak about that well enough. It doesn't have that kind of reputation. What Mayor Kim has been doing um, to, to shed the light of Boston being a racist white city um, with her advertising campaign over the past couple of months, I think is one of the marketing campaigns, one of the marketing strategies that we do need to be employing. This is going to impact not just tourism, this is going to impact people willing to come and engage with the city, uh, which is a very different city from what it was 50 years ago. Um, in terms of retaining talent, students are important. I talked about the funnel of you know 300,000 folks um, coming into the city every single year, and then ultimately we don't retain many of those students. If you look at Stanford, if you look at Berkeley, about 80% of those folks actually stay in Northern California. Um, in, in, at Harvard and MIT, the numbers are between 20 and 30 percent in any given year. Um, we need to do a better job about making folks stay here. I, I, having gone through the experience myself, I think one of the reasons that folks don't is because they don't spend any summers here. They spend the winters here and they're like, okay, you know, this is pretty brutal. But if you spend a summer here, you go to the Cape, you go to Nantucket, you go anywhere on the North Shore, you go anywhere like to, to the Berkshire, et cetera. This is, this is God's country in the, in, in the summertime. I mean, like we, we invented the burning man, right? Like the Berkshires in the summer with Tanglewood is is the East Coast version of, of burning man. We have a casino that's like a five minute drive away. If you're in San Francisco and you want to go to a casino, that's like, you know, you got to fly to Las Vegas. We're the Las Vegas of the East Coast. Um, and we don't do a good enough job about talking about all of these things. Um, uh, in terms of attracting immigrants, um, 
uh, we can be a little bit more targeted about making folks who um, are uh, coming in for technical reasons, you know, for 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 um, uh, graduate jobs, um, PhD programs, et cetera, to be excited about the city of Boston so that they don't leave it um, after the fact. Um, a lot of folks who come into the city are gushing to go into a different community afterwards or go back to their own home country. One of the ways I thought we could do this is through movies. Why isn't there no like great Bollywood film, for example, about Boston? We, we have it about New York all the time. We have Queen, you know, looking at Paris and Amsterdam. Why is there no great Bollywood film about, about, uh, about Boston? I'll shut up now. I have a lot of other ideas. Um, um, Clem, I'm going to give you uh, the mic uh, in a moment, but I just want to remind our audience, uh, given that this is an important point uh, that Matt that Matt brought up, uh, uh, we're going to have a major race uh, in November. And uh, um, if we have... Uh, um, brand problem, a marketing problem, as uh, uh, many people seem uh, to, to, to think here in Boston, well, that's something that maybe the city and the new leader of the city could change or could do to, could, could act to, to change, to enforce change. Um, I was looking at the last polls uh, and it sounds like, uh, um, well, it's a long way to go, but it sounds like the city council, councillor Michelle Hu and uh, the acting major Kim Jenny are the front runners that anything can change um, until November. Uh, I'm just going to throw the question at all of you. Uh, what is the number one thing that the new mayor, uh, that the new major of Boston should focus on to help the Boston tech ecosystem? And Clem, this time uh, it's your turn, so feel free to chime in first. Building on what Yaz and Matt said, like we have strengths. Like, it, like if I've learned one thing since the emergence of Europe, France as an ecosystem, is we try to play to our strengths, not to to uh, to actually create something where we had gaps. The retention part that Matt highlighted, it's all the entire game. We're like the I'm an immigrant. I came to Boston during the winter, but stayed uh, enough to see like all the beautiful spring and everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, we, we are already a hub for attracting. We're already a hub that is attracting. We do, however, have a leaky bucket. When we speak to a startup, we all speak about retention. Uh, and so that's a one piece, like that's as a mayor, like as a platform, empowering a tech, and we're already good at it will be actually to enable these people to have perspective in the job market locally. Like we all are hiring, we all are desperate to bring the top talent and yet all the top candidates end up looking at New York at like uh, like all the coastal places. Like, like that's, like if there is only one thing, it's retention of talent and enabling a generation of people that is coming in to be recycled and embraced by the local ecosystem. So tactically, more job fairs, more like like uh, empowering, like more on the ground boots to get not only the academy, uh, the lo the local um, the local market like uh, uh, of students and graduates to see it, but there is an enormous pool, for instance, of spouse of immigrants coming here that are chronically underemployed. Right now, if we just speak about that, 70% of the spouse of immigrants are unemployed in the first three years after moving in. Plenty of re plenty of reason why, like visa structure, all that. But these are also people uh, that the need the network. Problem. I'm very familiar with uh, with that, uh, and uh, it's the visa, uh, the companion visa, the notoriously famous H one B. Unfortunately, it doesn't allow the spouse of an H one B holder to work, uh, and that's one of the many problems that we have. Uh, as However, well. most actually, so that's where I would challenge most immigrants moving to Boston are coming on G one, are coming on L one, are coming on O one and O two, on E two, and so exactly. where the spouse can work, and these are like networks that we are seeing all the communities that are less fraction with uh yes you spoke about new york you spoke about LA, like where there are like even more uh networks that are coming together that are more inclusive and create uh create uh, uh create bridges between them so only one thing create bridges between the ecosystem we're a very segmented ecosystem life science live in one place tech lives in another mit live in one harvard live in another if you haven't gone to Ivy leagues or all the big university you live in another as a mayor just creating bridges between these ecosystems um i hate to do this it suggests that our time is running up so i'm just but there's one last question that i really want to ask our panelists and maybe all the attendees can keep discussing uh, in the break rooms uh, that I believe are about to uh, be opened. There's one last thing. 
let's say, guys, uh, you are able to place a bet on, uh, say, one place, one company, or one tech sector, or one person that we have in Boston that's going to propel uh, the Boston tech ecosystem forward. What would you bet on? Who or what would you put your money on? Um, you're free to jump in whenever you're ready. I would, I would just, uh, you know, uh, suggest to uh, your answer to be just a flash. And given that we are running up, running up of time, uh, feel free to jump in. I'll go first. Uh, it's Alston. Uh, Boston has the opportunity to be a modern day Florence and the Alston campus, the Alston revamp is going to be Seaport times three. Uh, we have clusters at Kendall, we have clusters in Longwood, we have clusters in Seaport. What Alston will be, will be a new Sand Hill. Um, it's, it's going to be the ecosystem in the future. Mm -hmm. Clem, what about you? I'm, I'm like deciding between legacy or visible hands. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, it's our say is what's going to be my bad, bad new present. No, so what I'm extremely, so I'm, I'm long on Mass Challenge as one of the main centers that is actually attracting talent from everywhere. So for me, Mass Challenge has been such a massive force for our ecosystem, the early stage tech. And so that's what I'm extremely long on, on top of Tech Stores and Visible Hands. Wow, Clem, really appreciate the support from Techstars, from Chicago, from Kansas City. It goes on and on and on, and especially at home in Boston. And they always say, you know, best founders bet on themselves. So I, I, I'm going to second you, Clem, and, and go with that. Um, but I'm also, I'm, I'm watching um, Helen uh, Adiosan at, at Care Academy as well. I think um, everyone should be watching her as well, not only as a founder, but as the role she plays in the ecosystem. So, I have to say, Techstars alum 2017. Uh, she's amazing. It's a love fest. <laughs> <laughs> and here comes another example of how close need to the ecosystem here. Everybody knows everybody, or almost.